All right, we're going to call the meeting to order. Uh, we should have uh, acknowledged the placement of the open meetings act closer there behind the gentleman, uh, behind behind them there. And uh, Dana, if you take a roll call. Arms? Yes. Gunther? Yes. Lange? Yep. Poppy? Yes. Potts? Yes. Van Heek? Yes. All present? Next item up is uh, we need a motion to legally convene. I so move. I'll second it. Yes. Van Heek? Yes. Arms? Yes. Gunther? Yes. Lange? Yep. Poppy? Yes. Motion carried. 6-0. Next item is the consent agenda. We need a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll make a motion. I'll second. Van Heek? Yes. Arms? Yes. Gunther? Yes. Lange? Yep. Poppy? Yes. Potts? Yes. Motion carried 6-0. Next item is uh, special business, and uh, this is a review of community engagement uh, summary. And uh, I believe, Mr. Luck. Um, <clears throat> like we've been discussing for a while, we do have several areas to discuss, so thank you for coming, uh, board members, everybody else that's here. I appreciate that. Um, we're fortunate enough to have a couple guests with us tonight that are gonna help with the information and answer some questions for us. We have uh, Mrs. Marsha Hearing from Nebraska Association of School Boards. She'll be on the uh, conference call here in just a little bit, here on the speaker. And then we also have uh, Mr. Tobin Buchanan, who's joining us with First National Capital Markets. Again, he can answer a bunch of questions for us. Um, and later on, he'll share kind of what they do uh, based on decisions to be, made in, uh, to be made in the future as well. Um, so thank you both for coming out and joining us, Marsha, as well. Um, so that we can begin this process. And with that, we'll begin the community um, engagement piece. Um, so everybody asked, why are we looking into this strategic planning? We've, we've been hearing from community members and, and other people, staff, so on. Why are we looking into this? Uh, basically, two years ago, there was a great study that was done, or a, a great opportunity with community engagement. Uh, Marsha Hearing led that with the, with the board and had a complete analysis of that. And that's part of what we're going to review tonight. Uh, just that that information is not forgotten. Um, show kind of what was found, what needs, and also what's been done since there, or since that time, because there's been a lot of, of work done in looking at this. Uh, so we'll take a look at that once once Marsha's done going through the summary, and then start looking at a couple of the other areas on the on the list specifically, just to um, start looking at options before we take it to the community to. Uh, see what kind of direction that we're looking at. So um, a lot of this is stemmed from, again, that, that strategic planning with the community engagement, uh, board discussion, discussions among staff, um, patrons, um, and basically everybody's just looking out for what's best for kids and what's best for crossing. So um, hopefully we can, we can start to develop direction, take that to the community, and, and go from there and, and um, help our kids be successful. So thank you. Crofton as a whole. So with that, unless there's any questions or anything to add, I'll let Marsha take it away. Okay. Um, are there any questions before I begin? And can you hear me clearly? Yeah. You're all right. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. All right. Well, first of all, thank you for allowing me to participate in your meeting uh, via a conference call. I appreciate that a great deal. I, I have been tied up today in a presence retreat in Nebraska City and so um, this was just uh, I was so appreciative of Chris's invitation to be present but not be present and so um, I want to I want to revisit where we were at um, where we are and where we're going with this and I want to open it up with um, commending the board and especially um, your new superintendent, um, Mr. Look, and the vision that you have for continuing what we started and initiated with the strategic, or excuse me, with the community engagement process. Um, I reflect back on the community meeting that we had in Crofton and um, remember it with, um, you know, I was so impressed with the attendance 
and the level of engagement that we had from your community members. By far one of the best turnouts that I've seen in a long time in a lot of districts. And that shows the um, level of support um, that you have from your community, uh, both parents, um, your general patrons, your business leaders. We had a phenomenal business leader luncheon. And so what we were able to do during that community engagement process is um, engage your stakeholders. Uh, we uh, engaged your uh, students, your teachers, classified staff, and um, community members. We did not have the opportunity, which we normally do, uh, to engage um, the board at a level that I um, feel uh, gives you that voice and opportunity to express your vision and your hopes for um, long-term planning. Um, but most especially, we didn't have the opportunity to engage administrators. And I, are our administrators present there this evening? Yes, yes two of us are here. And everyone will be joining us shortly. One, you're one short. Okay. Yep. All right. Well, um, so as we embarked upon uh, now, because we had entered into an agreement um, for strategic planning, and we put that on hold uh, because of the uh, turnover of superintendent, um, it was really important to me that we complete your engagement process. And um, we didn't necessarily want it to duplicate um, for the direction of the board, the community, yet we do want to engage the community. So what we tried to do, um, working collaboratively with your superintendent and, and his ability to vet with you as the board, um, what your priorities are, how you wish to approach this, we're taking as much data, um, all of the data that we've collected through the community engagement process, and then we re-engaged our teachers, we engaged our administrators, I still want the opportunity to engage board members, and then we're going to be circling back around with our needs analysis, and the needs analysis that you have in hand will look very, very different when you receive that, when we present that to you and to your community um, at your strategic overview committee, which you're going to be talking about this evening. Um, the purpose of your strategic overview committee, just for a moment I want to um, address that, is the opportunity for us to look at your mission statement, vision statement if you have one, motto if you have one, and belief or value statement. And it's not for the purpose of changing them, please don't hear me say that, but um, a critical component of efficient and effective strategic planning is to be sure that we do look at our mission. Does it, um, does it send the message to our patrons, to our parents, potential families that are looking at our district? Does it describe who we are as a district, what our culture is in our district? Does our vision statement articulate who we aspire to be in the future? And then that long-term plan, um, how do we align your strategic plan to your mission, to your vision? Um, and um, what is identified as needs and priorities? So essentially what we will do is, as, after we complete uh, the engagement of the stakeholders, we will combine the data that we currently have with the newly collected data, um, most recently, and it will be compiled into a needs analysis that will look very different than what you're seeing um, currently. That will be presented the night that we meet with the Strategic Overview Committee. We will also involve that committee, uh, the board, and any community members that attend that. Um, we will be presenting to them what we have learned um, through the needs analysis, identified needs and priorities. Um, something else that we've had your administrators do, um, I will tell board that you are only as good as the data that you receive. And so if something is not identified as a need in your data, um, how is it that we capture that or what's the safety mechanism that if it's not identified in the data, 
how is that articulated um, as a need in our strategic plan? So in addition to the data analysis process uh, where we're um, drawing in this data from the um, diverse stakeholder group, we also have your administrators complete what we call a comprehensive needs index. So your superintendent is going to complete this rubric um, document um, through the lens of the district as a whole. Elementary principal obviously will look um, through the lens of being um, in my building, elementary building, um, what do I believe our needs are at? How do I assess um, the building based upon the different categories that we've included in that comprehensive needs index? And the same would be true for our secondary principal. And what that index consists of are um, key areas of an effective school system. And so it could be that they're, um, they're assessing how well staff in the elementary building utilize data to drive instructional decision making. So we have a HAL program, for example, at the elementary level. Um, with our technology might, um, do we have an instructional model in our school district and how well is that being implemented at the elementary level? So my point is, is that our elementary principal may have a completely different analysis and um, they utilize a rubric to determine where they feel that they're at in their respective building on any one of these given categories. Yet your secondary principal and your superintendent have the autonomy to look through a lens at what they represent and they may rate their building or the district at a different level. Um, but ultimately what that does is that's another component that comes into that need and priorities um, that we're looking at in our needs analysis. And that we will be very respectful of that data that we receive from the administrators um, to reflect that in the needs analysis. So we'll present that needs analysis to you as a board. And then what we do is we, um, through our assessment of the data, um, you will um, have percentages of the number of people that identify the need. Um, you will have qualitative, qualitative and what we consider to be quantitative data. And then um, we will also isolate for you what we identify as a result of the data as being um, the top 10 needs priorities in your district. Now, um, also be rest assured that um, when we build your strategic plan from that needs analysis, it will be very comprehensive. So for example, we may include something in there about the instructional model. Let's say that you have an instructional model that has been implemented or adopted, and we are providing professional development to our staff, but we're in the early stages of implementing that instructional model. You may find that that's still in the strategic plan, and the administration will have the opportunity to um, look at the actual plan once it is built and provide us input, direction, or modifying editing, um, especially if they identify voids that we have failed to include in there that they anticipated would be reflected in the plan. Um, your strategic plan, when it is done, will encompass a three to five year long-term document or plan um, to drive decision making. Uh, at the board level, administrative level. And what we will do is we will take, uh, once the plan has been adopted by the board, uh, then we take the strategies from that plan and we send those back to superintendent, building administrators, and they have the opportunity to assess the strategies based upon um, greatest urgency, greatest impact, least urgent, least impact. And then the information that we receive from each one of your principals, we scatter plot that on an X, Y scale, and we're able to isolate number one priority in the plan, number two, et cetera. You may have 12 priorities, you may have eight priorities, you could have 20 priorities. Um, it's just dependent upon what we learn about your district through the needs analysis. And then once we do that, 
Um, what that enables us to do is then put your plan on a three to five year timeline. So priority one, um, this is what we would focus on. Now make no mistake about it, that doesn't mean that administration um, may also be working on priority three, maybe priority six. But what we want to do is we want to narrow the focus of your strategic plan so that um, they're not overwhelmed and it doesn't die on paper because it's just too much to manage. Um, I would also, um, another piece that we do um, is we'll also align the strategy. If you are in Nebraska Framework School or if you're a Cognitive School, which used to be Advanced Ed, we align your strategy to the standard in um, the Nebraska Framework or Cognia. And we also align your strategy to AQUEST. So when your administrators are filling out their evidence-based analysis, which determines your classification, they're going to be able to model through that evidence-based analysis the areas that they're addressing within AQUEST, within um, your accreditation platform. And then the last thing that I want to um, really commend you on is your willingness to look at how do we build uh, a financial, um, align our resources to our priorities and our plan. Um, and that ability to um, have that conversation, I think, um, is going to be very, very rich for you. I have several other districts um, that are in the process of doing something similar. And it's a piece that I actually years ago had a superintendent um, request, but we didn't have the mechanism to provide it. And so I'm really excited and I'm putting a plug in um, for First National that, that they are providing this service. And um, I, just, I think it's incredibly powerful for you as a board to understand um, how can we ensure that we carry out that plan and that um, the outcomes are realized as a result of aligning our resources in a purposeful manner. So uh, I, I commend you on that. But overall, uh, what's so nice about Crofton is that we have invested um, something into this, but it's not lost on the fact that even though that was two to three years ago that we did this, um, we still have the opportunity to revisit, still provide you uh, a comprehensive needs analysis and then build you um, a quality strategic plan to support you in your decision making. And then what's going to be important is how you tie back your uh, goals um, in your strategic plan to your board meeting so that you as a board are seeing how your discussion items and your action items are linked to the goals. That enables you as a board to manage and understand the progress and success of your plan. Um, administrators will be able to build into spark meetings if you still utilize that. They'll be able to build in presentations, uh, attachments, handouts at your board meeting that link directly back to a specific goal, which it enables them to be able to model to you that they are making progress um, on any given priority or any given goal. What kind of questions have I created? I do have the needs analysis still in front of me if you want to visit about that, but I want to, are there any questions? Because I know we've not really had an opportunity to talk through um, what is our process. Um, uh, Superintendent Book has done a phenomenal job of being my conduit to you as a board. Um, and we're trying to really modify our process because you have been through the community engagement component um, previously. Uh, we've been trying to modify to make this economically um, feasible and, and yet still provide you with a, a quality product. Marshall, this is Tammy. How are you? I'm good, Tammy. It's good to, good to talk to you via phone. <laughs> yes. Um, can you kind of explain to the board what exactly your role and your group does for everyone that's here? Uh, so what I heard you say was, can I explain to you what our role is? Yes. As NASB, okay. what you do for us. 
what we do for you. So are you talking in general terms? Yes. Yep, just general. Just general. Related to the strategic planning. Correct. Correct. Just, just strategic planning. Just, um, just in general, Marcia. Just, oh, no, in general? Yeah. So the support that we provide you as a membership organization? Yes. Okay. Yes, I absolutely will. Thank you. So the bit, absolutely. Um, the benefit of what we bring to your role as a board member, but most especially your district, um, there is multifaceted. Um, for me, having been a board member um, and given my area, my sphere of impact at the School Boards Association, um, the support that I provide you is multifaceted. Um, first and foremost, I'm here to serve you and support each one of you individually as a board member and as a collective board in providing um, education, um, resources um, regarding your roles, responsibilities as a board member. So we have a library of resources. You have a vacancy on your board. What you're able to do is contact me and, and say, Marsha, we've got this vacancy on the board. How do we fill it? And I'm going to start with Go back to policy. Do you have anything in policy that helps you or gives you direction on how you're going to fill a vacancy? Um, and then I'm going to send you a resource that I have for you, or I'll send you to our website and say you can download our annual board calendar. Um, so roles, responsibilities, and doing workshops with boards. Um, the greatest part of my job is have car can drive. And so I travel the state working with boards and with superintendent to provide and support. Um, I support you in the context that um, uh, you need to do a board retreat and we need to talk about rules, responsibilities. Uh, if you have a new superintendent, we're going to set goals um, or we want to set district goals, um, strategic planning, community engagement, um, help you with superintendent evaluation, um, which we have done, um, or we can do. We can but that's through an online process. We provide board self-assessment. Um, but the resource, the library resource that I have is, is that. Um, it can be um, workshops and learning opportunities that I present to the board to provide for boards. Um, for example, today, President's Retreat, new board member workshops, um, our candidate webinars that we're doing um, to educate that individual that has files to seek election to your board. How do we do um, a job of helping you orient that, um, orient that individual on um, what is my proper role of responsibility as a board member? Um, mediation, sometimes it's helping boards work through struggles. Um, sometimes we can have a board member that um, they, they have different viewpoints and um, I need to help um, work through the struggles that that might create for a board. Um, so it is multifaceted, um, but any board member, any time, it doesn't have to be just the board president, can pick up the phone, email me, call me, text me, any time, and I am responsive to that individual and um, providing support as best as I can. Um, helping them work through issues. It's not unusual that I'll receive a phone call from a board president or superintendent. I'm struggling with this, Marcia. Do you have any suggestions for how we might address this or how we might handle this? Um, so that's just, that's one piece. So that's my department. Um, there are four of us in my department. I have um, Corey Stanishek, who is an associate and uh, she helps me a lot with the strategic planning. Um, we have a data um, development um, individual, um, Melissa Lusk, and your administrators have had the opportunity to work with her. Teachers have worked with her um, because she administers um, all of our online surveys for community engagement and strategic planning. Um, Carla Cruz, uh, she's my administrative assistant. Um, she helps with administering online superintendent evaluations and board self-assessment. So then, in addition to that, the School Boards Association provides you with 
Probably Cap Insurance, which is um, a pool insurance, and I don't know if you're members of that, so I apologize because I don't know that. Um, we have a superintendent search service. We have a technology department that provides um, our online um, board meeting uh, board meeting platform, negotiation software. We have a policy service um, at the School Boards Association. Uh, we have um, our two. We oftentimes describe our, our association as a three-legged stool. Um, number one thing that we do, our mission is, is to provide you support in your role as a public um, member of a board. And then second is advocacy. And so we have an associate director, Colby Coas, um, that some of you might know who he is, be familiar with who he is, uh, that we provide you and try to um, enable you to advocate on behalf of your district so that you understand um, how uh, potential legislation can positively impact your district or potentially harm your district. And what can we do to help you to um, use your voice to um, engage and foster a working relationship with your state senator um, so that you're able to articulate to them um, this is a problem for us or we support you on this and, and here's where we're at in the district. Um, in addition to that, we used to have a legal counsel. We no longer do. It does not mean that districts cannot contact us regarding legal issues. You can. Um, the only caveat to that is that if you have already engaged a school attorney on a matter, we're going to circle you back to your school attorney and we want you to sustain that working relationship and follow the direction of your school attorney. Um, it's not unusual that when I'm working with the board, if I feel like um, that's their best recourse or your best recourse, I will say this may be something that you want to contact your school attorney about. Um, I am not an attorney and um, I, I shy away from that as much as possible, um, but I am here to give you guidance on best practice. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, Whoever I've been. Of course, I um, I want to make I, I don't want to overlook that and the importance of that. Um, but we are here to provide you learning opportunities to grow on your role as a school board member. Um, I work with the superintendent as much as I work with the board. I represent the board first and foremost. Um, but make no mistake about it, it's really important that I have a good working rela relationship as much with the board as I do with the superintendent um, because. Um, I encourage and advocate for strong and positive working relationships between the superintendent and the board. Um, one other area that um, I have spent some time in, um, and you have an individual in your district that is a member, um, is our administrative group. And we do provide support services and training um, for superintendent secretaries to serve the Board of Education. Uh, we do have bookkeepers that are a part of that organization, um, business managers that are also a part of that organization. Um, but the office of which that group was developed was solely um, for those individuals that provide um, direct support to the board um, as a board secretary. Um, and the reason that we have bookkeepers and business managers in that is because in the state of Nebraska, um, these individuals wear many hats. And just as much as they're a board secretary, oftentimes they are, in fact, um, a business manager or a bookkeeper. And, um, and so there are very few organizations out there that provide um, professional development or classified staff. And um, it's just been a great group, a really great group. Um, have, I, have I addressed what yes. you were looking for? Yes, definitely. Thank you. Okay, okay good. Good, good. Hey, Marsha. Larry here. Um, we, have some, we have some uh, district pat patrons in the room, and then kind of for the rest of the board, we have a new board member as well. Could you spend a little bit of time talking about, I think this is what you discussed, right, Chris? Just uh, if you could walk us through just a summary of the last time. I think it's been about 24 months since you yeah. were here and kind of shared that either the summary of data gathered, summary of needs, or the recommendations. If you could kind of just highlight some of those things, and know we're going to go in a little more detail later, but if you could at least highlight some of those. Yes, I will. 
hang on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab that. I'm at, actually at home, and that's if you heard the deduction voice there. Uh, hello, is when my husband came home. <laughs> so, okay, let me get myself back to the office. Okay, all right. Um, so yes, um, what I have in front of me, and um, do you do you have the advantage of having a copy in front of you as well? Yeah. Yep. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, so the one thing that I'm going to say to you, and I've already said it, I but it's worth repeating, is that um, given it's only been 24 months, um, this document and the service that we provide when it comes to community community engagement and strategic planning has evolved tremendously. Um, and that's forever something that we're going to do. That's just how I operate in my department. We do not rest on our laurels. How can we always make our services and programs better? And that's the one thing that I didn't say about the School Boards Association. Um, the best part of the membership of your um, participation in our organization in the membership is that we're here to provide you programs and services at a reduced rate. Um, we always have to be cognizant of the fact that we are spending tax dollars, and so we're not here to charge high, high dollars um, for the programs and services. We want to do it at a reasonable and respectable level. Um, I'll utilize strategic planning as a great, great example. Um, you know, the, the average size district um, being small that we've worked with, we've worked with all size districts, we've worked with class A schools, we've worked with class B, C, and D. Um, our smaller schools, the average um, strategic plan may be anywhere from $3,500 to $5,000. Um, a class A school could be sixty to 75000 That might seem high but I'm gonna give you something to compare that to. Um, we had a class A school um, in central Nebraska that two years ago, well it's been three years ago now, conducted strategic planning with um, a firm um, on one of the coasts. I couldn't specifically say the name of it right off the top of my head, um, but their, their bill for strategic planning with that firm was $250,000. So now I want you to compare that to what we were at when we were with Bellevue. Um, it is a far cry and <laughs> from, what, from what they were paying. I don't believe that you are also getting um, a watered down process or product either. Um, we're just simply doing it in a responsible manner and trying to keep the cost as low as possible. So now I want to jump back to um, the actual overview that you have in your possession. And this is reflective of the community engagement that, that we conducted um, 24 months ago. Um, and it is conducted differently than the way that we did it. The community meeting is still identical. And what we did is we came in, um, we, your commons area was tactful. Um, we had teachers, we had parents, we had um, retired, we had business leaders, um, a vast, vast array of community members that were present for that meeting. And what we did is we provided them with three questions um, that we took them through and allowed them the opportunity to um, respond to those questions. And um, we take that information, they, they talk about it in small focus groups, and then we have um, an individual at each table report out to the entire group and share um, what it is that they discuss at their table. What is so powerful about that is that our patrons find out very quickly that they're very much alike, um, the other individuals in the room, and sometimes um, they're learning things about um, from another group that, it, that wasn't a part of the discussion in their particular focus group. Um, but the evaluations were off the chart positive, very, very positive. Um, you have a very supportive community. So um, what we have on page three is we have a summary of the data that was gathered. Um, we met with students. Uh, we also um, conducted um, an actual on-site meeting with your certificated staff. And they actually could see 
needed a paper evaluation, whereas this time when we um, engaged your certificated staff, we did it through an online analysis. And then um, that will be tapped. Um, so that you understand the level of compre how comprehensive it is when we tag data. Um, Melissa and Carla and Corey will go through that data and they'll go through it line by line. If a teacher would respond to an open-ended question talking about student behavior um, and in the same response talk about professional development, that comment received two tasks. It would fall under student behaviors, um, discipline, um, or student behaviors, whatever, it depends upon the content of the response. And then there would also be a tag um, that would fall under the area of professional development. So we sift through the data um, very, very, in a very, very detailed, um, finite manner. So what we learned about you, um, I'm starting on page three, and I'm, I'm just going to hit the highlights. I'm, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. Um, but one of the things that was a concern that was expressed, and um, this is talking about um, a vast array of your stakeholders, is that at least 21 community members um, identified declining enrollment as being a challenge. And um, that is our area of, um, in the state of Nebraska, it can be any given district that is struggling for whatever given reason. Um, and one of the things I say about a strategic plan is that opportunity to say, what are we doing to be competitive um, with our neighboring district? Um, what are we doing to raise the bar to improve uh, the career education opportunities that we're providing within our school district? What are we doing to advance the opportunities to engage in um, college readiness, um, dual credit coursework, um, internship, mentorship, um, job shadowing, et cetera. So uh, a lot of what we learned, um, especially then, uh, facilities. Um, there was significant discussion about the need in facilities. And something that we have changed that was in, um, enveloped into the administrative surveys and what was uh, enveloped into the teacher surveys is we added a component um, we did a strategic plan with Texas City Community Schools, and um, one of their outcomes is they knew that they needed to address facilities. And so we worked with their architect to determine um, what is it that we want to ascertain from the stakeholders. And so we've added the component to our strategic planning that specifically addresses learning space, um, safety, educational, or excuse me, um, learning space to support enrollment, um, extracurricular access, safety, security. There's like five to six different categories. Um, the facilities resonated um, with multiple um, stakeholder groups. Technology was a concern. Um, and um, the needs in the district, at least there were four teachers, several students, developed that student access to technology. Um, was one of the most pressing issues. Um, if you look over at page four, I was just talking about the college career career readiness. Um, that's part of our eight question tenets. Um, what are we doing to provide the career access um, life skills? Um, depending upon the diversity, the demographics of our district, um, that lots of times will drive um, what we're doing for career readiness for providing those opportunities for students that wouldn't otherwise, um, they, they don't aspire, they don't see it in their future to be able to pursue an associate's degree or college. So what are we doing to enable them the opportunity to job shadow, to intern, to mentor? Um, what businesses are out there that will offer that student that opportunity to um, to work and possibly earn that opportunity to go to school, they pay for the school, they return to Crofton and they're employed right there um, as a result of that opportunity that was provided to them in high school. Um, community identified priorities. Um, we have before us funding concerns, housing, consolidation, and food service issues. 
Um, what's really, really interesting, and that I can tell you, I can fill your cup a little bit, is that it does not matter what school district we go into in the state of Nebraska, whether it's the Panhandle, our eastern Nebraska, north and south, it does not matter where we are at. Community issues um, that are common in every community we go into, the number one is going to be housing. And you think about, as a board, how does housing impact your administrator's ability to hire? If I've got a brand new teacher that's coming into the district and there's not affordable housing, um, apartment, um, I've got a family that's moving in, they have five kids, we don't have adequate or, or a house that is suitable um, for them to move their family in, um, they, may, they may pick a neighboring district. Um, there, there are just a variety of different things that ha how housing impacts your community, and it's just not the viability of the school district. It can also be the viability of the community itself. Consolidation. Um, when asked to identify challenges that may impact the district in the next three to five years, and community members attended the community engagement meeting cited either the possibility of or the need to consider that. Um, it hasn't been all that many years ago that we had the five schools. Um, Crofton was not one of them, but we had the five schools that talked about um, that potential um, consolidation. And we do now have that unified district that recently did consolidate with two other districts, and they are building a brand new facility. Um, staff identified priorities. So what we've done is we've broken it down by our, our different stakeholder groups and the needs analysis that you're going to see um, sometimes late February, what my assumption would be to early March, is going to do just the same. Um, but communication was definitely something that resonated. Um, and I will tell you that it was a little bit of why I wanted to revisit um, where we were at. Uh, and I, that is not a reflection of the superintendent. Um, that was a new superintendent in the district. And um, it, there's always those perceptions of, um, I personally feel this. This is their opportunity to have a voice and articulate um, what they believe to be a concern. So I wanted that opportunity to revisit the, the data that we collected from your certificated staff. Um, professional development, you can see, um, received 57% of your teachers said yes. Uh, meaning, when asked if the district provides a relevant professional development plan and schedule, um, they liked it. But yet we had 43% that said no. Um, so when we think deeper into that, what does that mean? Um, I'm going to fill your cup here. Not unusual. The teachers will come back and say, yes, they're professional development, but it is not relevant. Um, it's not applicable to me. I'd rather be working in my classroom, that type of thing. So this is not one that um, is necessarily a high-flying red flag, um, but we have to be respectful of the fact that this is how they feel. Uh, this is that opportunity for us to address um, this particular identified need uh, through the strap plan. And then when we go to social, emotional, and behavior issues, uh, again, much like housing, much like daycare oftentimes, um, social, emotional, mental health issues uh, is a significant issue in most every school. Um, I'm going to say throughout the United States, but we are not um, isolated from it here in the state of Nebraska. This is another area that the School Boards Association is working on your behalf. Um, we are piloting, uh, the Board Leadership Department is working collaboratively with UNL, Dr. Gus Dahl, and we are piloting a social-emotional classroom resilience survey in Sutton Public Schools. Um, all great um, were involved in this. And um, we are working to try to help to identify ways that um, school districts have the ability to address the social-emotional um, learning needs and resiliency. And when we talk about social and emotional, there's a variety of different things that we're encompassing into that descriptive um, statement or title. And that would mean it could be anywhere from the student that um, undergoes um, significant amount of anxiety because of test taking. 
Um, it could be suicidal tendency. It could be um, the struggles that they have at home. Um, and um, it could be socioeconomic and um, not knowing where that next meal is going to come from. Or a divorced parent and struggling um, with, you know, single parent household and mom works at night and therefore mom is not home. And we've got two kids that are home alone overnight. Um, and one little guy um, has a headache, um, but we don't want a 10 year old administering headache medicine. And they come to school the next day and guess what? The little guy is sleepy. You know, there are so many different things that we at school districts today that we must cope with to support the success of our students. And every district is facing this. What are we doing to help you? Um, and who's addressing this? Um, it's a need that is not going to go away um, because we ignore it. And so when I see social, emotional, behavioral issues, um, I'm going to tell you that um, there would dart any school district. Um, this can be, and most typically, um, is uh, an identified need or priority. Um, collaboration, curriculum alignment. Um, so much of our survey that we um, utilize with our teachers and with our administrators um, is very educationally, um, that's the root of it. So we're asking questions of our cert certified staff, our teachers. Um, have you adopted curriculum in your course subject areas, which is going to be math, um, English language arts, and science? Have you aligned your curriculum to the standards? Do you have an instructional model? Have you aligned your teacher evaluation to the instructional model? That's a question that we're going to be asking administrators. Um, what's professional development like? What's your culture like? Um, are you safe? Do you feel safe at school? Um, it's not a climate survey. It's truly trying to better understand where are we as a system? And do we have the components in place to support an effective um, quality education that we're providing our students. The business leader luncheon was held over the noon hour um, downtown, and I want to say, because I was actually one that facilitated, I want to say that we had maybe about 12 that were there. And I don't know if there's any board members that um, you were able to set in on that session with me, and so you might correct me on my number, but it was a great turnout and really, really good uh, conversation. It's not unusual that the um, conversation with business leaders will be um, targeted towards career college readiness. Um, what are they seeing in kids when they apply for a job? Um, are they, do they have the ability to fill out a job application? What kind of skill set knowledge pardon me, are we equipping them with to be successful? if they embark upon a career. Um, but it just empowers our business leaders to tell us what what you're looking for in that job applicant. Or if you've had kids that have come in and worked in um, your place of business, um, what does that look like? And um, do you identify areas of need? On page six, we have a summary of needs that um, gives you somewhat of a, an order in what we're seeing as a chronological order of priority, it doesn't mean that anything has less of a value. I want you to hear me say that. Um, but the identified need, um, you can see, looks at stabilizing the growth of student enrollment, top five, alleviate space constraints at all levels. The facility, facility is resonated um, with most of your stakeholder groups, providing the adequate Facilities, improving student access to technology, um, teacher technology training, expanding opportunities for career technical um, trades and training. And I'm going to stop at that one. The summary of recommendations is a, um, what I would say a combined um, articulation of really what you're seeing um, a summary of needs above. Um, and then that second on the second page and then our next step and always community engagement community engagement for me is the core component of quality strategic planning 
because a good strategic plan uh, enables a board of education um, to engage a diverse internal, external stakeholder uh, group. And what I mean by that, internal is going to be students, by staff, certified staff, administrators, board of education. Externally, we are looking at your um, community members, your business leaders, retired patrons, as much as your parents. We do have a parent survey um, that we can send out a link to. We can send it out via uh, email um, and or we can put a link on your website. Usually we send it out by email. We have a little bit better response rate. Um, but that is something that is available to you as the board if you're interested in that. Um, it's not going to be an additional fee. Um, it's just part of our engagement process. Um, it's not something that we provided um, through the community engagement um, process two years ago, but it, it is a component that we have added since then. Okay, I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> what kind of questions have I generated? Uh, Marcia, this is Roger Lane. Hey, uh, on that curriculum model, who sets that curriculum model on the state level, or is that a national model? The curriculum model, like when I talked about the core curriculum? Yeah, core curriculum. Okay. Who's, who yeah, sets that? Do not confuse that, Roger. Thank you for asking me that question. I, I'm not talking about, you know, core curriculum like we've heard at the national level. What I'm talking about is just simply our core subject areas, our areas that um, in SCAD or state standards, um, those are the areas that were being tested on um, as a result of the state standards. So that's going to be science, math, uh, English language, art. And so because of those areas, um, it's important that that we have a curriculum that we understand what um, what is our curriculum. And I'm not saying that that is a, don't hear me say that that's a, a textbook or that's a science and math or whatever the case may be. I'm simply saying, have we as a school system talked about what we, what our math curriculum is? And when we look at our test, data from our, uh, from our students, it could be math data, it could be our standards, our NSCAD data, it could be ACT scores, that type of thing. Um, but how are we looking at how our kids are performing when they move from grade to grade and level to level? So when we have, when we've adopted curriculum, the third grade teacher knows what they're teaching in third grade, and it supports what's going to be happening in fourth grade, we're helping our kids transition from grade to grade and level to level in a successful manner. It also may mean that your district, your teachers and your administrators have worked collaboratively to align your curriculum both horizontally and vertically so that as kids transition, um, we're implementing um, concept theory in it to ensure their success um, as they are preparing for the standards, but more importantly, as they're progressing through your system. So um, I, I'm really glad that you asked that question. We're not looking at the, the you know, core curriculum from the national level. I'm just saying in those core general subject areas, do you have an adopted curriculum? Okay, so what you're saying then is that you look at the test scores to kind of go back to see where we need to focus our curriculum on? Or, right. Or? So, in other words, what I would say to a Board of Education, Roger, is I say, I don't expect you as a board to decipher data. I fully expect that you're receiving data from your administrators and they're explaining to you the progress, success that you're deriving as a school district. But in turn, what I want you to be able to do as the Board of Education is be able to look at your superintendent and say, how are we responding to this data? Does it mean that we need to update our curriculum? Does it mean that we don't have an instructional model? And so we don't have a consistent um, 
manner in which curriculum is presented to kids. We don't have a common language. We don't have a common um, instructional method that we implement in each classroom. So whether I'm in a third grade classroom or I go to fourth grade, um, the teachers are presenting the material in a like fashion because of that instructional model. Um, when a district has not aligned their curriculum to the state standard, um, that could be a lot of reasons why we're not performing well on our NSCAD test, our standard test. And don't hear me say that I think that we're teaching to the test. We teach a lot of other things besides just teaching to the test. But if we haven't aligned our curriculum to the standards, we are not setting our kids up for success. Uh, we've got to have that scope and sequence there so that I, as a third grade teacher, I'm saying, here's where I need to be. But how am I checking to see if my kids are learning it? And um, am I progressing um, so that I'm going to be able to cover the materials I need before the kids take that test this spring? Okay, thanks, Marcia. Marcia, Claire, Claire here. And our needs, our number one priority is the stability of our student population and growth. Do you have any recommendations what it would take to increase the student population or any ideas? I'm sorry, do I have any recommendations? Claire, can you repeat that? Yes, our number one need is stability and growth of our pupil population. Do you have yeah. any recommendations what it would take or what, what, would, what would it take to increase this population mm -hmm. of our students? Right. Um, when we build the actual draft plan, depending upon the guiding principle or the goal that we're going to build into it, um, we may very well address, uh, you know, what we're doing to promote market our school district. Um, but do we? How are we performing as a district? Um, are we a sought out um, geographic um, school within a geographic area? Um, why not Crofton? Why did it take Crofton over, you know, who, whomever else that you would say is a competitor of yours? Um, if they can choose between school A and school B, why do we want them to choose Crofton? What is it that you provide there that's different than us? Excuse me, so we, when we talk about career college readiness, the opportunities that you're providing kids, mentoring, internships, job shadowing, um, career academies, whatever, your dual credit, your how you've um, partnered with area community colleges, et cetera, et cetera, um, how does that set you apart from other school districts where um, it's to my advantage that my child attends this school district versus another. So it may not be as black and white and as pointed as this is what we're going to grow enrollment as much as it is what are we doing to ensure that we have an effective system and we are providing a vast number of opportunities for kids to explore and um, look at their strengths and um, just, you know, expanded learning opportunities to give them a, a better advantage as they embark upon a career or college experience. Does that make sense, Claire? <clears throat> yes, it does. Okay. But uh, how do you know, how do we test and how do we figure out if we're doing the right things and uh, we're getting this? Good report. Is there some way to tell them that? Mm-hmm. Um, it, it is. Um, sometimes we're, we're losing them for different reasons. Um, I don't consider Crofton in this category, but I there have been times that I'm working in really, really small remote school districts where um, maybe they're not providing the um, uh, you know, extracurricular activities that other districts are providing. 
And the hard conversation is, you know, don't shoot the messenger, but if you do not provide these opportunities, um, mom and dad, grandpa and grandma are going to consider um, a different school district because they want to afford um, that opportunity to their kids. And um, the reality of it is, is that we do. We do have to continually grow and improve um, what we're providing as opportunities to learn, opportunities to participate, because we know that kids that are, that are involved in extracurricular activities are far more, uh, oftentimes more successful in the classroom because of the diverse opportunities that they have. So um, it, it's not as simple as just saying, we need to grow our numbers. What are we doing to grow those numbers? Why are we making Crofton um, a, a destination point for um, academics, uh, for uh, other opportunities um, that enhance their learning experience in your district? Where do we get go to get this information out to the public, what we do offer? I'm sorry, um, did, was that a question? Yes. What do you do? Okay. Do you advertise? How do you get this information out that what we do offer? Um, okay, um, you're right. Um, what that ends up being then, Claire, is what are we doing to market ourselves? Yes. Um, how do we know that? Um, and more and more districts are investing in um, that PR person or um, different ways to, um, I describe it as, did you know? Um, too often, I, I go into these districts and there's amazing things happening, but it's the best kept secret about your district. And um, I'll even say that about your patrons. Um, do your patrons even know the great things that are happening in your school district? And sometimes, so sometimes the, what I'm gonna build in is what are we doing to, um, to engage and educate our um, community members on the great things that we are doing? Or um, what is it that your community offers your business leaders that potentially um, a, you know, a student in your district could have a full um, education um, because of employment um, as a student? Um, they'll send them away, they'll educate them, and um, basically in return, uh, we would like to see you uh, work in our work in our business for at least a minimum of five years to recover what we've invested in you. Um, there are so many different things that you can be doing, but uh, 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 did you know to your patrons of how can we partner to provide a better education, provide opportunities for our students? Um, part of it is marketing. Um, another part of it is um, not overlooking the great things that are happening and understanding that that's not commonplace um, always in every district. And that's what I typically find. Thank you. You're absolutely clear. So, uh, Marsha. Yes. Um, looking at this thing, there's a lot happened since we had this first community meeting. Uh, uh -huh. I don't remember if we had bought the land that we bought on both sides of the the original school. Um, yes. Yes. Was that, was that after that? Or was that before? I don't remember. I believe it was after the community engagement. Okay. And then the other yes. thing is, one of the one of the items was um, in uh, behavioral that look at hiring a full-time elementary counselor we've done that so right. so yes. how do we update this thing so we don't keep going over the stuff we've already done um, what I would probably I appreciate you saying that because you're right um, you know what what have we crossed off our list I think that it would be a benefit um, if I um, will work closely with your superintendent to um, address, identify needs that we have in here, um, how they, maybe they haven't carried out. Um, 
And some of that, I, I also believe that the needs analysis, because we are updating the needs analysis, um, including your administrators and um, your teachers, I think that hopefully we'll also have um, the benefit of realizing different needs as compared to what is enveloped into that current document. Okay. Yeah, and Marcia, I think part of our next uh, part of this, we're going to kind of walk through those identified needs and kind of where we're at. And Chris is going to okay. walk us through that. So we're red on some, green on some, yellow on some other things. But That'd we do great. we do feel pretty That'd good about great. a lot of the stuff we've accomplished since that 24 month ago meeting. I think that would be really important to the process because I agree. I don't. Um, we need to put our energies into what's going to be a benefit to you and including items that have already been um, taken care of. Um, we just, it, it's really, you know, for us is that's our time. Okay. And Marsha, I can send those updates to you as well. Um, that would be great, soon. that would be great. Thanks for making the time for us, Marsha, on short notice. I think that we figured this out last Friday, so I appreciate it. No problem. I really appreciated it. Um, if you have questions um, later in the evening, I am home this evening. Um, I'm not traveling. Um, do not hesitate to text me, call me, um, and um, I'll be available to you, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Thanks, Marcia. Most definitely. Have a good evening and good luck with the rest of your meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Most definitely. Goodbye. Goodbye. If you don't know, we plan on doing this with just Chris, but then we thought, why not just have Marcia come in and do this for us? So that's when we decided that on Friday. Questions? Comments, anything before we move on? All right. So I'll hit on, on kind of what we just discussed there, basically identifying. Uh, so this is the list of the identified needs that, that were on the analysis. And then, um, like it says there, red is there's no considerable progress made, blue, some progress made, and green, considerable progress made. So we'll buzz through these. Um, we've hit on some of them. Uh, some of them we have not. So again, um, we'll, we'll go through it fairly quickly here. So the first one there, stabilizing gross student enrollment. We've kind of discussed that already, already but just working um, with community and then um, getting getting out there. The last five years, really, I looked at the, the enrollment and we're actually pretty stable the last five years. So we're, we're holding pretty good there. So, um, so is that red then? So what's that? So is that red? I mean, I feel like we have a lot of students that option enroll in our district. Yeah, we're actually, uh, I, yeah, so for, I'm for my five years of being here, this is, we're actually up in the with the year before I got here, only 26 graduated. The year I got here, only 28 graduated. The year for that, only 30 graduated. I think every class right now has over 30 kids in it at the high school. So our enrollment's actually up in the five years that I've been here. I have. I think there's a lot of back that have had kids. We have open enrollment. So we have 15, 20 more elementary kids, and I know our option enrollment is higher than any new district around us, so I'm, yeah. I guess I'm wondering if, so, yeah, if that's red. Well, I think we, we marked it as red because we haven't done anything yeah. to really talk about that, but I'd say we're definitely green on the number. Yeah. It's just we haven't spent a whole lot of time figuring out what we're going to do or discussing it. Yeah, 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 you're definitely right. We're probably green on the data, yeah. but red on what we've done to discuss it. To do something about it. Gotcha, gotcha. That makes sense. Uh, the next two are, are two that we'll, we'll discuss in more detail a little bit later with the alleviate space constraints at all, level, at all levels and then also um, providing adequate facilities for extracurricular activities at the high school. Uh, like I said, we'll, we'll go into more details on those here just a little bit later and uh, get some more information. Uh, improved student technology across um, all levels. That's green, but there's been a lot with that. We're continuing to work on that, uh, hopefully fulfill one-to-one -one at the elementary, if not this year, then the next year. Um, but we're getting closer and we're also starting to update things uh, like smart boards and, and work on our infrastructure 
uh, infrastructure at the elementary is a big one on our, our uh, list for this summer with our technology guys. Um, also, improved teacher technology training uh, through in-service, all those items are usually taken care of. We're actually next year uh, looking at taking the teachers to NIDA, which will be a great opportunity for all of them to grow <coughs> in technology and, and meet their, their uh, own personal needs in the classroom. Expand opportunities for career technical trades training. Um, done a lot with that. I mentioned the land purchase. That's helped the FFA really build their program. They, they get to go out there and, and uh, take that from, from the start of the season, grow a product and, and all the steps that they have to do with that and engaging with community members as well. Um, Mr. Sanger with the CTE lab and, and CNC plasma cutter, um, huge upgrade out there. We've got distance learning students coming in. <clears throat> We're working with other another district on um, CNA, um, just a, a wide variety there. And then updating computer labs and then smart boards upgrades as well. Um, anything else to add on CTE, Mr. Ostermeyer? Well, the, the college and career readiness class we offer, start off in the, I think the same year this was put out, um, where we have kids that have to go out and do four mandatory, mandatory internships and get out with different people and see what it is they want to do. Um, I think that's been a big uh, help for some students. Also, that helps them write resumes, helps them uh, get their you know, cover letters, and they also do mock interviews with different community people um, have come in and actually put kids through interviews to kind of help them, again, and critique them, say, okay, well, here's something you did really good, here's something you did well. So I think those are um, some opportunities we're giving students their junior and senior year, along with our distance learning, our, I mean, our, our, our dual credit classes uh, we have, uh, We've expanded the number of dual credit classes and the different colleges that we actually take dual credit classes from um, to help uh, juniors and seniors get a leg up when they go to college, saving some money also. Uh, the next one there, uh, explore alternative sources for funding for existing and future programs. Um, really hasn't been a bunch done. I do know, like, like Mrs. Pack, was able to receive a grant this year to pay for our HAL program and really has started to take off with that. So um, kind of in the starting phase of that. Uh, improve availability of affordable housing in the community, and that's going to be, you know, working with the community, addressing it, everybody addressing it, and see what options are available. And we sold a house. We did sell a house. Yeah, there's one. <laughs> two of them. Two of them. Well, yeah, I think there was one a couple years ago, wasn't there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember that. Sure. Um, address the community's concerns about consolidation. Um, with, with our, I'd say with our enrollment right now, you know, we're sitting, sitting pretty good on that one. Uh, improve the quality of food service program. Uh, we're very fortunate we have the Knox County Cattlemen's uh, Association really helping us with the beef program. Um, they really um, brought us a lot this year and, and we're very appreciative of, of that. The kids really are too. Um, with the credit we received through that, we've also purchased an oven at the elementary school, which is in place now. Um, Talking to the kids, administrators, there's been an improvement with uh, homemade meals with our, our program. Um, we always hear about portion size, sizes, but unfortunately, part of that is that there's federal regulations that have to be um, accounted for and taken care of. So, so we try to push, um, but sometimes there's things that just can't be done. Uh, so, so that's one that we'll continue to evaluate. Any questions on any of, of this page before I go to the next ones? Chris, didn't yeah. Trump change the rules on that food thing? I think it's in process right now. I heard he something signed, on the other day. He signed it on Michelle Obama's birthday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we might be hearing more on that sooner than later, which I hope we didn't do <laughs> We made uh, Chris, I think yeah. you had pre. Is do you have another page? Of I these? have another page. Okay. Yes. Okay. I'll just go to that. All right. Continuing on. So, improved communication and opportunities for collaboration among staff at all levels. Um, working on that with in-service work time collaboration. Looking at options for future uh, possible curriculum leader to, to help align that curriculum for K-12, which is which is a, a goal of ours. Um, Provide relevant instruction related to professional development to staff. Again, kind of falls falls in line there. Um, we always look at the professional development. What's going to meet the needs of our students and our staff to, to help them grow. Um, let's see here. Ensure that teachers have adequate time and resources to prepare and implement 
effective instruction. So not just we're not just providing them with in-service days, but also work days to to um, sometimes it's guided, sometimes they have time on their own to, to get that in, along with the time that they have daily to, to work on that. Also, we have, like I said, Mrs. Pack, who's our instructional technology leader. She's able to work with both staff and students to, to help them in that area. Improve social, emotional, behavioral support. Students mentioned the elementary counselor that's full time now. There's resources with the with ESU. Um, they've actually I've been talking to them a little bit about the possible team that addresses social emotional from within our district if we have those needs. So so those are some things we're looking at because that's always increasing. Um, unfortunately, those needs are. And then align curriculum across all levels. I kind of mentioned that already. Uh, just trying to work with our uh, instructional leaders, our teachers, to get that in place so that we can provide the best opportunity for kids on, on that. Um, and that pretty much sums up uh, that area. Any questions at this point? I just thought another identified need um, was the pre-K daycare situation. We talked about that a little bit. Yeah, there's nothing that's been done with that at this point. Um, I did see, like we have a, a conference coming up in the spring, um, the nurse conference that the board and myself um, attend, where there's some schools there that'll be talking about how they found grants and were able to fund their K or their pre-K program. Um, so looking forward to hear hear how they do that. And I don't know, maybe Mr. Buchanan has information on some of this as well. Good. So, so yeah, definitely something to, to look into. If make the pre-K and the, the uh, dropping their kids off at daycare was a big one when I looked through all the, the answers from the community. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be one of our things we have to consider also. And that fall in mind as well with um, having the space to do it. Mm -hmm. Right now we, we don't. Yeah. Okay, we'll go ahead and dive into the next section, which is, is really the, the discussion of and options when we talk about strategic planning. I kind of hit on a lot of this during a board meeting here a while back, so um, I'll go through it fairly quickly, but don't hesitate to jump in, ask questions um, by building. Principals help, help out with this as well, because you, you'll know even better than I do. Um, with the process, uh, I won't bore you with it, this part again, because I think Marsha covered it pretty good, so I'll just go through that. I was just basically going to go through exactly what she, she said there on, as far as what's been done, completed steps. She's already mentioned that. And basically what's in process is some of the surveys, and, and uh, she mentioned interviews with the school board members as well. And then she'll go to that needs analysis. Uh, so tonight, a little bit later on, we'll look at the strategic overview committee, uh, kind of how we want to set that up who to ask to be a part of that, and so on and so forth. And then, um, again, what she said as far as completing the remainder of strategic planning. Was there any questions on any of that process? I think we've got them answered pretty good for one. She was very thorough. She yes. was thorough. She was very thorough. <laughs> so di different uh, district identified needs. Um, I mentioned that was the, the second and third item in the summary of needs, and those were to alleviate space constraints at all levels and to provide adequate facilities for extracurricular activities at the high school. Okay, so we'll look at the, the four or three areas I have here is the elementary school, high school, of course, and then safety and security, which these three are, are there's keys within each one. So at the elementary school, here's a list of everything that, that we have concerns on, uh, items that are gonna have to be addressed sooner than later, just because it's, it's time to address them there. They're at the end of their lifespan as far as roofs and things like that. So that they might need some, some big work or, or something to, to help them last longer. So roof insulation, AC units, uh, technology infrastructure, flooring, electrical, plumbing, restrooms, <coughs> hallway and classroom ceilings, playground drainage, uh, some work in the nurse's office, gym and building lights, security cameras, uh, computer music classrooms connect to the main building, and then added classroom space like we mentioned with the pre-K. Um, Mr. Ravi, is there anything I'm missing there or anything you'd like to add to that? Any questions on? I don't know what's left. 
sidewalk. Keep the sidewalk. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So yeah, there's there's a lot of concerns, a lot of things that we need to figure out what we'd like to do with them, basically. High school, uh, gym floor, it's, it's, I put this on here, it's up to get fully sanded down, uh, not this summer, the following summer. Uh, locker rooms, we only have two locker rooms. We have no wrestling room. Our weight room's fairly small. If it was larger and had an outside entrance, we could maybe um, get the community involved with it, uh, offer an op opportunity there. Um, classrooms, or short classrooms up here as well. Um, Build a weight room, that'd be one more classroom. Commons area floor, I don't know if you've noticed, but we have some pretty good cracks running through there, so we're gonna have to address that fairly soon. Um, security cameras, CTE building, uh, this is in dis some discussions I've had with Mr. Sanger and, and uh, Mrs. Mann on, on options. They've been looking at some different options for the students that may provide us some bigger opportunities in the area. Um, some items that have been mentioned to me by Lori, our head custodian, uh, the football visitors bleachers are in bad shape, the home bleachers uh, could use a sandblasting and paint, uh, a barrier fence around our new chiller, which we just added this last year, and then uh, lighting, we just, we've just started to kind of change out to LED lights out here on some of our, our uh, fixtures. Anything to add to that, Mr. O? Not off the top of my head right now, that covers it. I mean, our, my main concerns is, since the first day I came in, I've expressed several times is, you know, locker rooms, um, having junior and high school kids together, having girls and boys sharing the same locker room during home events. Um, that's a major no-no compared to when you talk to lawyers and school safety and school law. Um, but it, it works here for now. And then also uh, with, with the wrestlers, I um, mean, when I first got here, they're above the bar downtown. They weren't even on the site, and now they're in their commons, which which I, I appreciate. Kate, he's a great wrestling coach, and a nice job changing the program. He doesn't worry about that stuff, but they need a spot. You know, it's, it's one of the things that um, it's hard to build something if you don't have something for them. So looking at some needs there and some different things we can do to, to help that out. So. Yeah, and, and speaking of those, um, like with the locker rooms, that could if we had more locker rooms, we could host more, which could provide opportunities across the community, um, restaurants, gas stations, all those places. And then wrestling room without our mats having a specific place, our, our mats are starting to um, deteriorate a lot faster than they should in that <coughs> 10 to $15,000 a mat. So definitely area of concern. It would also be nice to have a stage. That yeah, that's, and that's another one I should have put on here. That's a performing area for our, our one actor. Speech kids are. It'd be nice to have this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just threw this on here. I've already kind of mentioned it. The security cameras, they need to be placed across the district. The ones we have are in poor shape, not, very, not doing a very good job. And then um, another item that would be great to have just because it will make it so much more secure because we don't know who has keys. How many keys are out there, whatnot, a key fob system would, would help with that tremendously. Um, and it would really help um, with the safety and the security of our district buildings. Anything to add to those guys? Our campus is so bad that it's almost like having nothing, pretty yeah. much. Well, well, didn't we get something at the elementary and you say it's not very good? Our campus system is um, inadequate and Functional right now too. Yeah, because you can't. If I go up to the door, you can't really tell it's me. Oh no, that that's okay. I'm talking about the cameras in the hallways. Yeah. The the hallways. Oh, yeah. in the school. Yeah. 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 So yeah. But the outside yeah. one, the yeah. entrance yeah. ones, they're okay. Yeah, those are fine. Yeah, those are yeah. okay. I, I took that the other way. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then plus, I think there's. I think everybody in the community has a key to the elementary school. So. <laughs> I think uh, reading some of these like a community type center community library or mm -hmm. you know if we're gonna do some with the library get the community involved I think is good too yeah. like uh, I think Laurel does that uh, community library like Utah community weight room Mm -hmm. I, uh, I can't 
or I've seen that in another district too. I can't remember where it was, but but they did that. And it, they liked it. Really liked it. So, so I put together just some of these are, are pretty specific estimates. Some of them are, are estimates. Um, they weren't full details, but they're on here. Um, so the roofs. We know at the elementary here, uh, we're looking at three different roof areas along some electrical work. You're looking at between $180,000 and $200,000. Um, just talked to the guy today to get this quote on the AC units. Uh, be approximately $3,000 each. We need nine or 10 of those at the elementary. About, you're looking at about $30,000. I could be off on that number. Is there more than that? Probably. Uh, should it okay. So you're looking around $30,000 if we um, you split units and do it off two classrooms. It might be a little bit cheaper, but you still have electrical work probably on top of all of this. And making sure that our electrical um, in place is sufficient to support it. Um, tech infrastructure, it's, it's gonna be roughly around fifteen to $30,000, but we have some E-rate funds that will help with that cost. Uh, and that's actually on the, the, the list for this summer. Uh, if you haven't haven't heard about how the internet's at the elementary. If you go to one end of the building, you're looking at about, what, 100 meg, but the other one, the other side, you're down to 10 to 20 at times because there's some some uh, faulty wiring, there's some the discs aren't in the right spot. Um, our 2020 guys have come in and, and done some work with that, but there's still a lot more to do uh, so that it can support the one-to-one -one down there. Uh, flooring. Um, I didn't have a price on there, but it just depends on what you're looking at. Uh, we priced out the classrooms roughly about $3,000, and, and that process has been started, but there's always, you want to keep that rotation going to keep our, our flooring up. The unknown costs, and a lot of these are huge costs, would be like the electrical. Um, we know there's a lot of electrical issues down there. Uh, plumbing, um, but again, a lot of issues with that, and we're talking plumbing and electrical, that there's, there's some center blocks, there's areas that will be very hard to um, change out. Um, it can be done in a different way, but it could be it could be um, a lot more cost. Uh, playground drainage, if you're on the north side, the skating rink I think is set up at this point, <laughs> probably. It's pretty icy out there. Uh, nurse's office, there's no water going to the nurse's office and, and some other needs there. Uh, hallway and classroom ceilings, if you ever go in there and take a look up, there's some issues with from leaks and, and different things at different levels. Uh, lighting upgrades, just we need to, to be in that process at some point to change over to LEDs. The gym can use an upgrade with lighting as well. It's the old, old system in there. Um, we mentioned add classrooms, huge cost, and then um, whatever else is on, on the list. There's just, these are the costs, like I said, they're unknown, and I'm not sure what they'd be. I'm sure they'd be fairly high, especially the electrical and plumbing. Yes. So the electrical is, is that would be the electrical cost of adding AC units and doing all that, or is it just that it's so inadequate? Is it dangerous? I, I think there's a lot of areas that need changed out just because it doesn't support what we need. Does that get inspected? It would. It would have to be at, at that point. Um, I mean, is there? I don't know how building I, I don't electrical think there's codes work. I mean, I'm, I'm just concerned about the fire yeah, And I, I know that adequate. there's a concern with that, but as we add like one-to-one -one and things like that, the past electrical is not going to be sufficient for what we need. Oh, okay. So you're just talking that as we add stuff, we'll need to update the electrical. We're not what's talking there? about inadequate for what we've got going on right now. Well, at some point, you'll need to replace what's there right now. I don't know what point we had any is. Have we had any issues with fire or? Uh, not a fire or anything like that I'm aware of. You don't know. What did you ask that? Uh, when was the school built? Oh, 1963. Two? Two? Yeah. Two. Okay. Two. Okay. And any, anything on electrical that you can uh, think I, of right I off think, the top of your desk? Yeah, I just think what you guys are talking about. If, if there's updates to the building, that would be a concern. Yeah. No, I think for now it, it's fine. The plumbing is always a little, is okay. But I think if we're going to update that building, that would be. That would be a concern trying yeah. to match the old, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, but if we just leave it as it is, yeah. Question: Any other questions? How about mold? Do we have any mold issues? No. 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 That was actually tested this year. Oh, was this year? Okay, you break. Okay, that's great. Anything else? Uh, 
uh, high school gym floor to, to get that sanded down looking uh, the quota is right between 20 and 24,000 depending on what what you go with um, chiller barrier fence width is going to be about two to four thousand dollars it might actually be a project for our students in mr. Sanders class and then I mentioned lighting upgrades we've just been changing out LEDs as needed so instead of buying uh, regular what are they fluorescent bulbs or whatever we buy LEDs and change them out because you eliminate the ballast so it, it uh, works out pretty good. Uh, the unknown costs, locker rooms, wrestling room, weight room, adding of classrooms, and then uh, common area floor, because that'll depend on what kind of flooring we go with. And, and these are all probably um, costs that an engineer or maybe Tobin knows more about as well as we get, get to that point. Any questions on anything with that? Does the high school have a nurse's office? Yes. With yep. a sink? And water? Sink and water, yeah. Okay. yeah it's okay. utilized for a lot of things, but yeah, it says it, it's had a full bathroom in there, there's a cot in there, um, there is a running water with a sink in there. Um, it also gets used as our counseling room at times. It also gets, you know, it's just, it's a, uh, we're, yeah, we're short on some, some rooms, so, yeah. Any other questions on the high school? Uh, safety and security, I've kind of mentioned it. Uh, security cameras, I've got quotes ranging from about $30,000 to $100,000, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit more, um, probably at our next board meeting or the one following that. And then I, I've got a guy actually coming to check out for key fob systems, but they said roughly you're looking about 2500 to 3500 a door. And if we went, uh, I, I estimated 10 at the high school outside doors. Of course, we don't have to do all doors, but um, 10 at the high school, 7 at the elementary, you're looking between Forty to sixty thousand dollars for, for that, those items. Questions on any of that? Uh, just just to mention them, some other areas of need that that uh, I keep an eye on and kind of building a list of, of things as we replace and, and develop a plan. Uh, technology I mentioned we want to finish that one to one K twelve. And it's going to be continuous updates every year with technology. We'll just have to get on a rotation of updating so many iPads or so many smart boards, so many, uh, like this year, teachers' computers are, are on the list. Um, staffing, always looking at, at that as an area of need. I mentioned curriculum. Um, there might be an opportunity to do something with uh, the curriculum area and then other areas of, of need as needed, whether it's with social emotional or, or uh, nursing or, or items like that. There's some items to discuss. Uh, vehicles, just just so that you're aware, we, you know, we'll keep track of that and we'll have to replace one, you know, over time we'll replace them and try to develop a plan for that. Uh, snow removal and other district equipment, just as needed, uh, working with the custodians. Oops, it's the same thing. So, so I've mentioned all the, the needs. Anything to add before we jump into this next step or any questions? And so possible options, and, and these are just options, not a recommendation, anything like that, just, just uh, things to throw out there. I know there's probably many other options, uh, but just some that, that we've discussed and kind of been looking at. So uh, an option is to upgrade or renovate the current elementary school. Uh, another option is to build a new elementary school, possibly attach it to the current high school, so you have one K-12 building. Um, maybe make it a little easier to streamline our staff that, that goes back and forth. Um, possibility of building a new high school or in the current high school where we're sitting now becomes the elementary school. Um, add pre-K through classroom addition and that would be on well either one whether we renovated the current elementary school and added to it or if we built an elementary school or if we made the high school uh, just make a pre-K through that. Uh, we've talked to the, this one new locker rooms, wrestling room, weight room, uh, connect a CTE classroom or lab to the high school um, also talking with, like Mr. Sanger there, we have we do have the land if we want to do something there to bring in some outside agencies, some outside schools, uh, create more distance learning opportunities, um, and make our district um, where students want to want to come and, and be a part of just because the opportunities we provide. There's some, some things we could look at there. Uh, another option we could just look at adding a competition gym that has locker rooms, wrestling room, weight room, stage or performance auditorium. Uh, could be something that's connected or separate from the current high school. I've seen that at, at District 24 as well. 
Uh, I already kind of hit on the CTE building. It could could help out the FFA, welding metals, construction, CLA programs, on the main more. Uh, then another one that's been mentioned is an all-weather track. Uh, fencing around that area, uh, eventually have to replace lighting, uh, seating, so on and so forth. Any questions, thoughts with any of that? So next question is always, how would you pay for something like any of these options? Um, Mr. Buchanan's here to kind of talk about what they do. Um, you, he might be able to answer some questions with this. I put uh, Matt Fisher and Carl Dietz also work with him, so I put their names on there as well. But um, feel free to ask him questions, and, and I'll let him kind of do his thing and, and uh, tell us what, what they can offer. Jump right, <coughs> jump right in. I, I got one more question. Oh, sure. uh, so, like next steps on this, this is this is where we get the what do we call it, the SOC? Yes. Um, those people involved get a whole bunch of community members involved and, and try to find out exactly what the community wants. Mm -hmm. And then at some point have another community engagement meeting yes. to get a lot of feedback. Yes. So they steer us in the right direction. Right? Yeah, yeah. We we'll use the um, SOC committee yep. to not only look at the strategic planning, but I think also some options and then kind of narrow down our options, whether that's this group or everybody, and then present options to the, the community because we really want to, yeah. to hear what they have to say. That's what you guys have said since yeah. day one, is, is we want their feedback so that we can make a, a decision based on what the community would like to see. So yeah, those are, those are our next steps. So. Yes, tell them to jump right in. All right. Tell us what our options <laughs> Make calls. I appreciate the chance to be here tonight. Got to meet a lot of you down at the state ed conference last November. For some of you have just seen <coughs> first time here tonight. Um, honestly, I know, yes, we're a business and we'll get to that part eventually if that's a good fit. But I think tonight, maybe just being a resource, first of all, to talk through some of these things, share with you guys and the public on what we have seen other schools do as they look at ways to tackle some of these issues. So very common issues across a lot of buildings. A little bit about my background. I was an educator for 16 years, um, six years as a superintendent out west in Grand, Nebraska, and we dealt with these issues. We had some buildings and we were a consolidated district. And you get to the point that you're just trying to, I think, have a efficient plan for how you're trying to address building needs. And as you have aging facilities, trying to figure out um, if there is a point that you're, there's a better option or you're, you're trying to make sure you don't invest somewhere that maybe down the road you go away from that. Things like that. Just making a good, good decision, having a good plan, which is what you're talking about tonight. So just a little bit on, on the funding options that many of you maybe know and maybe you guys maybe know, but uh, what a lot of districts can do, if it's possible, is... I think what most would want to do is kind of that, how do we save up over time to address these needs and not borrow money, not have to pay interest, not have to pay fees and things like that. So you're currently, this fiscal year, you guys levy a little over four cents in your building fund, which I know you all know. Um, I don't know if everybody else knows that, but that generates about $250,000 a year. And you're, that building fund is for things like land acquisition, site improvements, uh, facility improvement, um, really new items or expansion and things like that. Um, you also have a depreciation fund that you utilize that I think has, I think your current building fund has about 700,000 in it or will at the end of this fiscal year, minus whatever you're spending on projects. You have a depreciation fund to address facility things that wear out or, or vehicles and things like that. So the one question we always get asked is, well, how do we just save up? Let's just save up over time and tackle these things. And that is a, that is a good option. And you guys are in a situation that your overall levy right now is about 75 cents. Your, your levy lid is five. So technically, not saying you should or would do this, but technically the board could 
maximize their building fund to 14 cents a year. Um, that's the most you can levy in your special building fund is 14 cents as long as that levy and your general fund levy don't exceed $1.05. If you did that every year, you could generate about $850,000, I believe. So that's not chump change, that is some money, but what we're finding with a lot of districts, if they have enough needs or growing facility needs, that you can pretty easily, and we could help you do this, look at what the cost of your projects are. Unfortunately, how much they go up each year, and a lot of boards find themselves kind of chasing a number on a project and, and losing the buying power of their tax dollar to inflation and interest and things like that. All depends on how much you need to do and how much time you have to do that. But that is one way that, that people tackle that. Um, I want to touch on some legislation tonight too, if any of you are following that, because that's going to impact things, maybe, um, possibly. I mean, I think something's going to get done this year or next year with regards to, to taxes and that, how that affects school district ability. But so the next question that often gets asked is, well, if that model doesn't work, we can't achieve what we need to over time, and we're chasing a number. How do we? Get some money for identified projects now. Get it all at once. Address needs at one time. There's cost to that. Lock in a, an interest rate and then pay that back over time. So one vehicle that a lot of schools have been using, and I don't know if this district has ever done it, is known as a lease purchase. And people know the terminology lease purchase, but as it applies to school districts, and I have some of that information I'll, I'll pass around, I just don't mean to look ahead. <laughs> it's, it's building. It's all building right now. Um, a lease purchase for a school district right now allows a board to enter into a lease purchase agreement up to seven years. So the statute for school districts is seven years. That lease purchase debt needs to be paid back. If you're doing a brick and mortar type project, we're not talking copier leases or vehicle leases, which can be paid out of your general fund. We're talking brick and mortar type major capital improvement projects. So if you're going to borrow money and pay that back and it's that type of project, it needs to be paid back with your special building fund levy. And so several years ago when valuations were climbing, 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 boards were entering into lease purchases based on the security of that 14 cents a year to pay that back over time, but that environment has changed. Banks would look at that and go, well, valuations just keep going up, so we'll loan all the way out to that 14 cents because it looks like no problem every year that bringing in the tax dollars to make that payment. We're finding in the last few years where when we do look back at the last five years of valuation and they've, they've, they've gone down and maybe they're stabilizing some now in some areas, Banks are looking at that saying, well, if you borrow out to your 14 cents and your valuation goes down, you can't get enough tax dollars to make your payment. So you're seeing banks that do those lease purchases really wanting to limit it closer to like 10 cents. And so that's just limiting the size of some projects. LB 974, which is the one they're talking about, the tax relief bill, if you read all the way down through it, is talking about um, lease purchases being limited to six cents, or, I, and I, I'm not an expert on this. We've had a phone call with bond attorneys to try to figure out interpretations on this, and it's still to be determined a bit, or possibly what you're already levying in your building fund if it's above six cents. So the grandfather piece, grandfathering in, would only be, if you were already levying 10 and you were gonna do a lease purchase, potentially you could keep using the 10 cents to finish off your lease. But if you're not into something like that, they don't want a bunch of people rushing in and doing these lease purchases before the, the bill gets signed into law. So that's still in the works and being discussed, but a, a lease purchase can be done by a majority vote of the board. And so that's seen as both a positive from some perspectives and a negative from some perspectives. Um, you're doing potentially, depends on the size of it, a large capital improvement project without letting the public vote on that. Now, a lot of the lease purchases we're involved in, we handle it very much like you might a bond issue. 
you hold public meetings, you have conversations, you get the public's feel for if they're behind that project. Um, let's say, for example, a million dollar vocational agriculture building in Alma, where the board's communicating with the public, saying this is what we want to do, this program is going to be great for us, here's the cost of doing that. They get the comfort level feeling like everybody's behind this project, it's not real controversial, let's do the lease purchase and go. Um, all the way from something that's really big, I think, draws more, more a concern maybe from the public that it's not a public vote. Um, so, if you don't fall under that parameter with what you need to do, and I realize you guys don't know that yet, the next option that people look at is it's two words a lot of people don't even ever want to hear said, said maybe, but um, again, if a, if a district's in a situation that they can't save up over time to do something, they need to monetize a certain amount of money at one time to tackle a project or projects and lock an interest rate, and obviously a bond issue is something that a lot of districts, districts are pursuing. Um, again, that, that takes a lot of communication, a lot of what you're talking about tonight to get to a point that, that uh, a project is identified and the needs are identified. Um, when it comes to bond issues, they're mostly 20-year bonds right now that, that we're seeing. Some large metro, metro area districts can do, will do like a 30-year bond. It's pretty unusual, like an Elkhorn or a Bennington that's just growing. And, and anyone who's looking to buy those bonds is looking and going, there's no way this place isn't going to be around in 30 years. Otherwise, 20 years is pretty, pretty common. Um, November of 17, which is a little over a year ago, the 20-year bond rates had climbed up to about 3.7% for 20 years. Uh, today, they're below 2.5%. At that time, we thought they were up and going up continually. Um, I know if you've ever heard people like me talk, we're always saying things like, oh, it's historically low interest. You should do this and that. Um, I'm not going to say that. I said it, but I said it sarcastically. Uh, but the rates have come back down. So. We were most recently involved, worked with the three districts as part of the Summerlin project. Uh, and one of the things we're able to share with that public is, if you would have done it back then versus what they're getting in the market now, they're saving about $4 million in interest on a, on a pretty big, big project, $34 million. But that's, that's good news to say that's going toward construction, not just interest costs. So said a lot there. I'm going to hand these out, I think. Pass them down, maybe. Question, any questions on what I've said so far? I think I, I can move in a little bit to what I see most districts do when they're at the point you're at. I'm not. Again, I think I'm just here tonight as a, as a resource, as sharing. We've been a lot, part of a lot of projects. Um, some of what I think you do next has nothing. We are involved in it sometimes, but it's it's engaging different expertise. So what I, where I see you're at now is that what a lot of districts at this point in time, they really need to figure out what they have, what the cost to fix or bring things up to code is, and what the cost is to do portions of that new and so on. And so without that information, it's really hard for you guys even to move forward and engage engage your public. So a lot of schools will usually engage an architect of some sort to do like a facility study. So when I say facility study, I think that's exactly how I've seen that done is what I just said. They go in and look at everything they have. So you have the conversation about the electrical at the, at the elementary. Um, it may work fine. An architect may come in and say, you know, this is 50 years old. It's out of code. You're fine as long as you don't do anything, but if you start touching this building and doing any kind of renovation, it's all going to come up to code and things like that. So that's their expertise, architect engineering, and I think getting that kind of information down is what I've seen a lot of boards do to start to pull information together. And then maybe, and maybe they're still sharing it with that, that group, the strategic planning group, but there's some kind of sharing with the public of here's kind of what we're dealing with. And here's the costs, and your investment in a facility study, or a facility study, it just depends. 
on the architect, some of them will charge you 10 grand. Some of them maybe will say, we'll just do it. We want to really be considered if you do a project or it's 10 grand and if you hire us, that gets credited. There's people out there that want to come in and help you do that, that piece. And then what I've seen a lot of schools do is share that information with their public and it kind of depends on your dynamic. If you're looking for a lot of public feedback and guidance, it's kind of asking the public a couple simple maybe survey questions. Do you agree we have some, some urgent needs we need to address? And you support us now maybe engaging an architect, which is gonna be a little more of a financial commitment, to truly come up with two or three or four options to show you in a few months so we can dig in even more to what's this really look like or what's this really cost. So that's what I, that's kind of a step by step. I see that, I see that quite a bit. Um, it's usually important for boards to let their public know that we haven't decided anything, we are exploring. And I've seen boards come in front of the public without some of that stuff done and just have lists like you have tonight. And it doesn't go anywhere because they need you to take a little more steps to get some better information on cost. They really want to know potential costs of the, the projects and then you use someone like us to say okay what does that mean for us from a tax impact and a financial impact um, when we start to think about different options. I'll talk a lot. Almost as much as Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> I'll stop there for now to ask, answer some questions or. In other words, you're saying that we're up against the long term finance and some of prices and those needed. Don't you feel that? Don't you feel I like do. you have I to do. have. I, do. I mean, I think they would even tell you. We can tell we know more what we're talking here. But I think I see your, your situation. And I was in it, even when I was an educator superintendent, is if we just keep kind of spending some decent sized money on things. We, we don't want to end up spending $500,000 and then realize we, didn't need we maybe should have done all that. You're going to have to do some stuff intermittently. You're just trying to keep a safe environment, keep your facilities where they're at until you make a decision on where is your best investment over time to set your district up for success um, to make sure you have quality facilities and things like that. Well, my big concern is like what Why Not did. So Why Not got down to, to a an enrollment that allowed outside perimeters to opt out of the district and so then they did so then they had to raise their mill levy to support the school and being scared of losing their school then they went past a bond issue now they're at a dollar five and I talked to a guy in the Wyandotte district the other day he says I'm paying a hundred dollars an acre and that's not sustainable I don't care what anybody says and, and ours is getting high, I'm paying 50, 60. Uh, it's getting to the point where you're buying your land back again. And that's an issue, I don't care what anybody says. You ain't mentioned anything about valuation change. You know, if valuations keep going up, great. Yeah. If it goes down, then you're gonna be in trouble. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. So. Yeah, I think those are, I mean, those are the, and, and I think to have that conversation, you kind of have to know what, it co what, it's, what the cost effect's going to be, right? right? And the and tax what happens? Impact. What happens in their situation? They've spent this money like Newcastle did. Newcastle passed a bond. Now it's sitting empty. I don't think they even use it, do they? Yeah, they do. A little bit, but not all. Three, four, three, four, three, four, three, four, three, four, three, four there. Yeah, and so I don't they kind of did theirs though. I actually could coach at Newcastle for you. So I know a little bit about Newcastle. They actually purposely passed the bond for the school one day because they wanted a community place to meet. They had no good place to meet in that community. They said, well, we're probably not going to last very much longer, but let's just get this bond passed so our community can have some spot where we can actually meet, we can do things in, and they had the weight room in there that people can come, they pay a monthly fee to use the weight room in there. So they kind of didn't know when they were going to close anyway. Theirs was a little uh -huh. bit different. They just wanted to have a nice spot for the community to be able to get gathered because they didn't have anything else there. So it's a little different in that situation than what Why Not did. Why Not was just really trying to save their school and save right, their exactly. Yeah, because if you pass a bond, if you vote, have a vote and it passes, and it's a 20 year bond, and this is what you're getting at, I think, and maybe you already know this, and you no longer have a district in 10 years, and you merge with somebody, the taxpayers that voted on that bond are responsible for the bond. 
even if you go into another district, right. um, they don't. That other district does not they don't set, assume take that on your debt because they never got a vote on it. Right. It remains on the valuation of the people that voted until it's until it's expired. So it's the same. Yeah, it, you're right. It, I think you got to figure out the numbers and see what the investment is, what your future looks like. Make sure you're not doing something that is going to create that that situation. And then the other problem is we we want our enrollment to go up, but we're already kind of maxed out on our facilities. So we can go promote getting more people in the district, and we're going to exacerbate the problem we're already dealing with. Those are the things we got to look at, you know. Because I I'm pretty sure we're maxed out. I I, I saw that myself. So. So the most successful. And on your perspective of success, but when the boards are seeing a need, it's when you can help your community understand you have urgent needs and they all can see it and you do a good job of explaining to them, this is what we're dealing with, and people go, yep, you've got to do something. And then you come up with some kind of project solution, whatever that is, at whatever level or size it is, and it, it looks to them like you've got these needs, you've come up with something that's not overdone, it addresses most of these. Sometimes you'll lose people if you leave a ton of stuff unaddressed. So it's kind of finding a good solution that most people go, well, that makes sense. I see what you got. That makes sense. And people usually think it's just the finances, and I'm not saying it isn't a lot of it. But sometimes if you do those two things and the financial part is tolerable, and people, nobody wants it. Nobody wants to pay increased taxes or anything like that. But if those two things make sense, then some people look at it and go, it's up to them to decide then their own personal feeling on whether they can support that that you've laid out for them at the at the financial impact it has for for them. When, when people have done that well and transparent and effectively, then that's where we've seen um, the most success and the least amount of division and, and things like that. And that's when we are involved and, and we help. We help with the financial impact piece because we have access to the bond market, we do all those things. We also help with the information campaign piece, and I think where we're effective, and I think part of that comes from my experience sitting where you sat, is we try to help really run a good, transparent, effective information campaign so that people are just informed. It's not a vote for it campaign, it's not anything like that. And I think communities we've worked in, when we've left, um, there's not a ton of division and things like that because no one's played dirty to try to do a certain message. It's just, it's just do a good job of, of getting information out there, basically. I don't even really need to go through this unless you want to. But, um, and then the other part of the story that we're seeing in a lot of districts, if you get to a point where there's a bond issue, is the net tax impact. So if you're building funds at 4.3, um, I put, I don't want anyone to run out of here and say they're running a $10 million bond issue, but I put a page in there just as a, just a, a marker or it's about, it's almost toward the back. Just to start giving you an idea for conversation on what that, what that might look like. But I really don't want anyone to run out of here feeling like you guys talked about run a $10 million bond issue. But I think it gives you some multiplier to kind of think about. Are you, is everybody on that page? Yep. So a $10 million bond issue at 2.5% right now for 20 years has an annual payment of about $640,000. So based on your valuation, current valuation, which can change year to year, go down. Um, what have you seen recently going down lot percentage going about straight across it's starting to stabilize and we're seeing some of that i don't know i don't know what it's going to do in the future but we we don't usually try to project valuation we'll say we'll just base it off of where we're at and be very understanding that we know that's it, it can change over time but based on that you know, crofton would have to have a bond levy of 11 cents to pay that annual payment. So just to kind of give you a, a multiplier, that means about 1.1 cents per million dollars of whatever bond issue. So if you're thinking, if it needs to be 5 million, then it's about 
5.5 cents. Now, what a lot of districts' situation is, they've been levying in their building fund to address needs over time. So depending on your future planning, if it's an 11 cent levy, but it addresses almost all of your building needs, I don't know if it does, we have no idea yet, and you don't need to keep putting 4.3 in your building fund, maybe you're only gonna start doing a penny, then you gotta talk about how that all nets out, I guess. And, and sometimes when we do that, people feel like it's smoke and mirrors and things like that, and, and they'll say, well, you can raise that building fund levy, you can't promise that, and we say, yep. The board can raise that building fund levy, we're just telling you projection-wise, when we look at the, the projects we think we might need to do in the next 10 years, we think we just keep doing this in our building fund and, and this will be our bond fund. Anyway, my point being that you have to get to the point where you can tell that story and, and help people understand what the true impact overall is of what you're trying to trying to accomplish. And I'm not saying, you know, I don't need to keep saying this, but I'm not saying you should do any of this. Um, just want to give information tonight and be a, be a resource, I guess, and answer questions. So on that $10 million, you're saying the taxpayer impact is the 110 per Per hundred thousand. So, valuation, correct? Yeah, and this is again just kind of a just throwing it. I have no clue what it what it would be. And then if you pull that, so for, per one hundred thousand dollars of valuation, it'd be one hundred ten dollars. So, in uh, looked at, so that's like so that's just the bond fund. Right. Depends on what your net is, but eleven cents would be six thirty seven on an irrigated quarter on average. For a ten million dollar project, three sixty three on dry land and two forty seven on grass land, just based on your county's average. So that information is just for discussion to give you guys, as you start digging in and getting numbers, to just provide some benchmark information to realize what you're what you're dealing with a little bit financially. If that's where the discussion goes. So right now we've got currently sell for purchase for two and a half. Two and a half percent. And that's a that's an average rate across twenty years of bonds. What have we been spending for upkeep? Four or five hundred thousand? I mean you got a list there that's gonna crack the heck out of three quarters of a million pretty easy. So fifteen million dollar bond at two and a half percent interest is $375,000 in interest payments and you got a new building. Mm -hmm. And when we ask architects what the cost is well, each yeah, year, they, know, say, they say like 4% is what they figure construction goes up every year. So that's sometimes when people say you should just save, sometimes you feel like if it's two and a half and it's going up four, you're maybe losing ground. But our, our building fund right now is four point point oh four three one 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 two one. Yeah, so we're four point three cents. And that generates seven hundred sixty-five thousand dollars a year. Yeah. I think it generates about two hundred fifty thousand. Yes, right. Oh, that's what's in our fifty okay. yeah. yeah. percent. Oh, that's what you'll have. That's that's what your budget. Your seven hundred fifty is what you're budgeted to end up with this fiscal year as a as a building fund reserve, which. We either leave there for future building needs, you use some of it to do projects or pay down on a project, or a little bit of both. But your 4.3 cents brings in about 250,000 a year. Your valuation is 585 million, so about 58,500 per penny in tax. So how can you help us? On next steps so we have we kind of do several things that you need but that's not really what I was doing. so what I've been mostly doing with school districts that are considering a, a project potentially a bond issue is working with them as what's called municipal advisor or financial advisor that's different than the old model which was underwriting now I am an underwriter on some issues like a fire station or a city, but on school bond elections, uh, the rules changed in 2014. They said, if you're gonna sell bonds for a school, 
you should be part of any kind of informational committee work. Uh, you shouldn't be talking to the board and the superintendent about the rest of their budget and other types of things. You can only talk about that bond issue, what it's going to cost, and it's very limited. The SEC in their eminent wisdom didn't, for huge cities, it went bankrupt, put that into place, and I think kind of hurt, hurt small schools and small towns because the Nebraska model was always the underwriters would help with that process. So it created a, a, a division of, of that. So we, in talking with bond attorneys, we wanted to help with all that stuff. With my school background and the things we've been involved in, it wasn't so much the selling of the bonds, it was working with the board and the, the administration and the community to do all those things, kind of the grind work actually. So we've been being engaged as municipal advisors since 2014 on these school bond elections. So the board is actually hiring us as a financial advisor. Um, it allows us to help you with kind of everything, all the election deadlines, all the meeting documents, all the financial stuff, looking at your budget, how it all fits in. What it doesn't allow us to do is if you do run a bond issue and it passes, we cannot sell the bonds at that point. So then we become your advisor and run a competitive process for firms to compete to sell your bonds. And you've got an advisor to take those, those responses and look at them and tell you whether they're being transparent on the rates they can achieve and the fees they're offering. And it really has been a very successful model. I think boards have appreciated having that even more than the underwriting. The fees for that, which is always what comes up next, has really, our model has been what you used to pay just an underwriter to do, we seek to split it, basically. So the boards aren't really paying any more for it. The underwriters don't love the idea because now they have to really share the money they used to be making with someone else. And now they don't really ever do anything but get a bond issue handed to them and then go sell it on that. So I think that's why it's been successful and boards have said, well, why wouldn't we have everybody on board that, that can help us? And then I put a page in there of, of all the issues we've been involved in since 2014. And, and uh, this is not by any means a, I guess I'm just proud that we've been, we've worked with 11 issuers that have decided to place bond issues on the ballot and 10 of them have passed. And I think it is because of our our process and how we go about things and how we help the community. Um, we really like to have a group of community members talking to community members more than a board telling people what needs to be done or administrators telling people what needs to be done. It's facilitating that whole process and those conversations. So are you able to help us before we, at what point do you get involved? I, we're, we like to be involved as, as soon as possible, I guess. So we even would like to help structure those initial public meetings a little bit to the, mo to the extent that you want help. Kind of use our experience with, with how you share stuff and how you don't say or commit to something accidentally that I've seen groups share with their public that a project's going to be six million because someone came in with their building and said, oh, I think you can do all this for six million. And then when they got further into it with the right experts, 12 million and that really created a lot of issues so we kind of share our experience and strategies on how you how you work with your group to build consensus how you share that with the public and then always looking at the financial impact and, and those kind of things so we try to make that engagement our, our engagement fee which has gone up a little bit since I talked to you guys before the because our bank has looked at the number of meetings we've gone to and all the travel and said it needs to be a little higher. But it's $12,500 to engage us. That, that's, that pays for all our travel and all that. If we work with you for nine months or a year and you decide we're not going to do a bond issue, there's just not the support or the need, that's all you're out. Um, you never pay us any more unless a bond issue passes and gets issued. And at that point, it's just like the old model where once you issue bonds, a percent of that goes to the MA and a percent of it goes to the underwriter. And like what percent are so we talking there? So I put that little fee schedule in there, a little bit of percentage. 
depends on the amount of size. So the old the old market underwriters used to charge about one and a half percent of par, they call it, or the principal amount. So on a on a ten million dollar bond, you're going to pay one hundred fifty thousand dollars to the underwriter to sell your bonds, and that comes out of the bond proceeds. Um, most of what we on a fifteen million dollar bond issue, I think we would be 06 percent. We we've had success getting an underwriter again because they're not they're not coming to anything anymore. They're just competing for it, and they're going to sell bonds on a certain day. We actually put the bond issue together and all that as your advisor and, and just basically give it to them. So they may be 0.5 or 0.6%. And so you're actually coming in under the, the old way of doing things. I think when an underwriter came here next month and said, you don't need those guys, just hire us, it might be 1% or 1.2%. But our history has shown that your people are getting it for at or under what they had normally paid to have all the services. And then when you go to sell the bonds, not that I need to keep pushing this, but this is what's happened a lot recently when we've been MA and there's been an underwriter. And under, it's time to sell the bonds, the underwriter tells the superintendent or the board, well, here's what the rates are today and what would you normally say? I know what I would have said as a superintendent. Okay, I don't know, right? Well, as now you have an MA, so we've, we've hired underwriters with districts and they've told the board one thing, here's the rates, you know, and then it comes time to sell them. Oh, well, they've kind of gone up a little bit. Well, now your MA says, nope, we know the market. That's not what you told them. Um, get it done at this rate. And that can save you 300,000, 500,000 in interest. So that's part of where uh, we don't usually even highlight that value as part of this process, but after the fact, there's tremendous value from having just that representation. So. Keith, what was the name of that outfit that finances? You remember what they were what they what they were called? No. Okay. That's, that's the, that's law, I don't know. So the the Nebraska it's changed a little bit. So Nebraska underwriting companies, Emeritus used to be the the biggest bond underwriter in the state. A lot of you, if you went to school conferences, you see the emerit emeritus. And all those bankers left last summer and went to a company called Piper Jaffer, which is headquartered out of Minneapolis. So if some of you saw those emeritus guys, they're all with a different company now. Emeritus is a Nebraska company. They're an insurance company, but they have that public finance team. They're still going. Like, we'll still hire them to sell bonds. They just don't have the, the bankers that go out anymore. They're responding to these RFPs, and they can still sell bonds at a pretty good rate. And DA Davidson is the other another Nebraska company that you'll see at conferences, and maybe that was the group. I'm not sure. Um, they're headquartered out of Montana, but they have Nebraska. They have Lincoln and Omaha offices. So Emer Emeritus, now Piper Jaffrey, DA Davidson, and us are competitors on other kinds of underwritings. We're the only group really doing the MA. MA stuff for, for school districts. Nobody wants to do it because it's the 20 meetings and it's the six months, but we like it. We think that's what we're good at. What about timeline? I mean, what have you seen in the past that you've worked on from contacting the community, see what they want, what the needs are of the district, to building a facility or doing the reconstruction? Of so it really, it just really does depend. It kind of just depends on how fast that process moves. It kind of depends on how urgent your needs are. I mean, when I worked with Newman Grove, they had preschoolers in an area where the fire marshal, like in a, an area without egress, said, you can't, you're not gonna have them here next year. So that really, some of those type of things push the timeline, sure. right? Um, it can be six to nine months to get to a point that, you have to get to a point, if you're thinking about calling a bond issue that you know the project number, and you're ready to, to have a meeting and, and put that on the ballot. So that can take, I mean, at a minimum, probably six months, just just to go through. The process I see where you guys are at now, laying this out, I think it's gonna take several months. Um, we would love to be involved at the, at the get-go. We think that we offer experience, and if you're looking at architects, we can share people we've worked with, and things like that. I don't know if we would recommend an architect firm, 
necessarily, but I think we can answer questions, you know, just about who we've worked with and who's a good fit, things like that. Um, the projects we've been a part of that have been most successful, if it gets to the level where you're thinking about a bond issue, we'll have an architect involved. If you're thinking about doing some kind of construction management model, which maybe I haven't even thought about that yet, that's another layer of do we just have an architect design it, bid it out, build it, or are we doing construction management? But if there's a construction manager having an architect design something that, that addresses your needs, architects will put a number on it. It'll be based on square footage mostly. If they build a lot of schools, they might have some good data. But sometimes they design it, tell you a number, and then it passes and you hire a construction company and they go, we can't build it for that. So, if you're thinking about construction management, sometimes it's nice to have an architect that designs it, probably does some square footage estimates. A construction company that actually is building schools, that can run that design through their estimators and steel and all those kind of things. And then a finance company of some sort that's going to look at that project and help you understand the financial impact. I think that gives you the most confidence talking to your public that the number and the project you're talking about is a good number because that's the worst place to be in is when you have have seen them out west where they passed it and the project comes in at three million more than than what the bond issue was and now they're adding a lease purchase on top of it. That's not a it's not where you want to be. So and it feels like you kind of have that team to build still and maybe take that first step on finding someone to do a facility study. I know some people out there that do that, that are, that are good. This team we're looking at building for Marsh's strategic, or with strategic planning, would you use the same team or would you vary that up? Uh, I, I don't see a reason not to, but that's a group that's already, mm-hmm. because, because that's a good point. So when I was at Shelby Rising City and some other groups that did a strategic plan, Every time they went out to the Republic, they were saying, we're not just doing this stuff because we thought it'd be cool. They're tying it back to their strategic plan that people were a part of saying, these are the things we're trying to achieve over the next five, 10 years. And these facility improvements fall right in line with that, that strategic plan. Uh, nothing in this project is outside of the scope of what was identified as what this district needs going forward. I mean, I think that gives you that well, something like that in a facility study gives you the facts when you're talking to your public, you're not ever looking like you kind of really didn't think it through. You just thought it'd be, let's just do this. I mean, I think that's what you want to avoid. You want to give yourself that foundation of information to start making decisions and having that group help you make decisions. Groups like that are often a very important part of getting to whatever project or process you're going to end up Because they've been a part of it all along and they're saying, yeah, we need to maybe consider doing something like this. So if you have a facility study and an architect has two separate ideas in one. Most of the time, I mean, it is architects. Architects usually are the ones that do that facility study. And they'll bring in, either they'll have an in-house engineer that will do your electrical and things like that, or, or they'll, they'll, they'll bring somebody in. So it might be a matter of reaching out to three or four architects and finding out what if anything they would charge it to do it? Um, they're probably gonna charge you a little. I don't think it, I've seen them for $5,000 or anywhere, it just depends. Again, they wanna build, start building that relationship with you. Um, you're not guaranteeing them anything, but I, I think they see that if they start off kind of knowing your buildings and building a relationship, do a good job, then if it comes time for you to select someone on a project, they hope that's them. And that's kind of part of a lot of their business models. And someone will just tell you up front, if we're doing this and walking away, then this is what it costs. And you probably pay a little more than, than other, other methods. With your expertise, you would count on who to get? Or I could, I would give you... Counsel is counsel to somebody that's reliable. Yeah, yeah. And there are several reliable. So I could help come up with some names of people that have done a nice job. It would depend on where they're out of, if that matters to you, if you want 
more local out of Norfolk or Omaha or even I don't know, even Carney's too far away. But there's there's groups that do that that uh, all do a good job that are I think would be a good fit. Yeah, I mean my expertise uh, expertise if I, it, is more financial. So I don't mean I don't want to go on record saying I told you guys to hire this architect, but I think I could be helpful in that conversation and share with you experience I've had working. With, the, with those architects and how, how good a job they've done, helping boards, talking to the public, and things like that. That's important, <clears throat> to have your architect be able to be a good communicator and, and do things in an effective way. So Chris, is it like Tobin, somebody like Tobin, or is it Marsha that kind of leads the process to get it to the community? to get us, you know, four or five different options. Is that Marsha's going to help do that, or is it a firm like Tobin's? I think Marsha's going to be more on the, um, the strategic planning side as far as, as the vision, the mission, and with the socks. I think getting to the other the financial side, I think that's their group right there. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, no, and, and, and we have... So Matt and Carl, Matt Fisher is a former superintendent at Ground Northwest, and Carl, and Matt ain't suffered with us that night. Carl is a former superintendent of Lala, and they've got a ton of, they're doing a, kind of a separate program where they're helping with uh, budgeting with new superintendents and, and boards that want some additional budget training, and looking at capital improvement, more like replacement schedules and things like that. They've been teaming with Marsha Kind of where this repeat the strategic plan stops with her is on the, the facilities and financial stuff. Sure. And so we've been, as we expanded into that, we've been careful to communicate with NASB and NCSA and say we're not trying to do something that you already do. And they and Matt Carl, go, they'll be presenting in Norfolk next week. Are you going to go into Wednesday, that? This Wednesday. This this week. So Matt Carl will be there presenting for NASB on school finance and things like that. Um, They've been partnering with Marsha more than I have recently, um, and basically, I think the answer to your question is where she kind of leaves off, and it's the facility and finance stuff they NSB doesn't do. Yeah, I think the hardest part, Chris, you want to go back one page? I think the hardest part is take this list and get it to three or four, see what the biggest needs are, and getting the community to funnel into one or two or three or four different things. I think that's the hardest part, but you can help us with that. Yeah, like something we're working with Takama Herman right now, the similar list, and once once that, and they have a group like what you're talking about, so once there's a cost, a cost is some education about the needs with that group, whether it's going through buildings and really understanding what these things are, looking at a cost involved with them, then we can kind of do a prioritization activity or whatever you want to call it that helps things rise to the top that people are saying I think people if they have to pay for it would support these I think these are you know if they're in there they might create it, 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 there is a process and we can help get to that point where you're prioritizing things it's going to be based on need and cost as to what people feel like the majority of the community would support and you can help us with getting the right community people there. A lot of community people. Yeah, I think if, you're, us, but if your group is, that. I mean, a group for a, a district community of size, if you can get 20 people is a great number probably. I think you're even okay with 10 to 12. It just depends. And are you talking the strategic planning committee? Or are you talk, I think I'm talking? I think either, either or. I don't know. Does Marsha have a recommended number for the strategic planning group? Um, we've got a little sheet here. I think it's... I mean, I've seen them all side. I, I just see, I think there's going to be a direct transition from that to facilities. So I think that having those same people who have gone through all that and can see the connection to your facility needs and where you're thinking about going to the strategic plan makes sense to me. I guess. There's no magic number. But five or six probably doesn't feel like a good cross section where 20 of different backgrounds, of different connections to the district, uh, really gives you that, that input as you're talking.
talking about stuff mm -hmm. to hear from a variety of, of backgrounds. Police want the biggest number of people weighing in, is I think what we're all looking for. Yeah. And your experience from the time to say we, we get going, so I guess what we're going to do, we're going to get going, get the community together, time you start, get through everything, get to either a lease purchase bond, get things flying, you're looking at what, two, three years minimum? For it. Depends on the project. Terms. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's the same. It just depends on what you're doing. Obviously, yeah. is it a, is it a little expansion or add on, or is it huge? Yeah. Is it is it? Uh, um, I want to know if you want more information on this kind of. I mean, in this, this is an even number year, even number year. So there's a general election and a primary. So if districts want to have a bond issue in an even number year. They're either going to hold it during the primary or general. And if they don't want to hold it at the primary or general, they're going to call a special election. It cannot be the month prior to or following the primary or general. So you can't have it in October just because you want it to because there's a, there's a general in November. So if you're not going to have it in November, you need to have it in September. But once you get into next year, an odd number year, um, you can call a special election in any month. And it's always the... First Tuesday after the second Monday of the month for a special election. And then it kind of comes down to what's the best time to have community engagement. You know, when we think about the ag community and what's the best time to have them be able to come to meetings and learn about it. Um, is it going to be mail-in or polling place? Most of them are mail-in these days if there's not a, a, a general or primary. And then it comes down to construction timeline because right. if it passes in March, do you really have all of everything designed and bid and really get a very much start in the summer? Maybe not. Maybe you're a little behind there. But that also depends on are you doing something that's touching a current building or are you doing something completely separate? So all those things, until you get a little further down the road, you just don't know. You ask me when do we want to get involved. We'd love to get involved as soon as possible. Um, I've, there's some of them where I've gone to some public meetings and I wasn't engaged yet, but the soup said, I'd like you just to come kind of listen. We've done that. Um, sometimes I'm sitting there going, oh my gosh, don't say that like that. You know, I wish I could have maybe helped, helped strategize the sharing of information, but it's up to you guys. We try to make it so it's not a huge risk, I guess, as far as the engagement amount. We haven't had anyone yet say, gosh, you guys weren't worth it, so we're I guess we're pretty proud of that. What's the what's the bidding process on construction? Whether it's adding something new or building, do you take is it open bid for those types of things? Like how does that So how like the different construction models? Yeah, or companies or so a design, bid, build, an architect is just going to design it, and they're going to do bidding specs, and they're just going to send it out. And I don't, I'm not an expert on all of this either. Right. And they're more just sending it out and having people competitively bid all the different pieces. And for CM, I think a CM, depending on which CM model, they give you the guaranteed maximum price, and they may self-perform self some things and bid other things out, right. and as long as they come in under that number, they can tell you and then there's other CM models too that are a little bit different, CMS agent, things like that. I think when you get further down the road, then you kind of, either you do some interviewing of companies or you hear some presentations on different, different construction delivery models to decide what the best fit is. I worked with Lee, they did a design, design build, which is basically uh, just a, a company hire a contractor basically that just does it all and Hausman's doing that I don't think Hausman's done a ton of design build that's more of a private it's been more of a private construction model private industry but some schools are doing that now I see that more on smaller projects but Lee's was close to 10 million and they did design build what was Summerlin? Summerlin was construction CM at, CM at risk so they have an architect and then they also had Hausman as construction manager Construction 
their pitches, Mr. Look doesn't have to be a construction manager. Um, we can still get to pull in a lot of stuff, I think, no matter what, if you do something. But the CM is supposed to be overseeing everything and communicating every month to the board. And I know the CM pitches I've seen, they talk about, they show you every bid. You get to see everything. It's all transparent as far as what's, what's bid and who bids what. I think they're all viable. I don't know if there's, it just depends on the fit and what you guys are looking for. I didn't really go through the handout, but that was okay. Yeah, that's I mean, all right. There's stuff in there about the MA process and glad to come out another time to call for answering questions. So the so the fee is like ten thousand to start. What if at any point we're not happy with what we're getting? Is it does it go away or what? What's how's that all work? Yeah, the contract usually has like a just a clause and they'll like break it. Yeah. Never had that happen. No, <laughs> I talked to Summerlin people and or Rachel and she she's very happy with your company. So. This really isn't any questions. After a while, but first we got. I know where we're at. Yeah. As as yep. yeah. But you have to start somewhere, right? You're doing right. the right things, and you, you know you have some needs. It's, it's hard to know how to tackle them until you probably have some real cost to what it would cost to tackle them. Mm -hmm. And that's how you start to, I think your project will start to maybe present itself in a way, and then you've got to go to your public and see what, see what they think. Best things we see people do, I guess, is be transparent in their process and not. The worst ones are when someone feels like something's already been decided and it's all just go through the motions to pretend like you're involving and getting feedback. I think that's where things don't go well. I've already been approached at what's going on. I heard they're going to do this. I heard they're going to do that. And you know, I said, well, there's nothing there. We just had a strategic planning meeting. That's all we've done. And I've had guys come up and say, why the hell didn't you put that elementary on that school when you <laughs> built it in 91? And it's like, it passed, you know? So you just can't win for trying it. Yeah. I hope I don't create. <laughs> They're running a $10 million bond up there. That's why they create that tonight. You're on video saying that. <laughs> Well, we'll get your number. We can always refer phone calls to you. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any reason for him to stay here for what we're going to talk about next? That's that's up to him. Um, it's your call. We can cut you loose if you'd like to go. <laughs> we're just going to talk about the uh, SOC. Yeah, we'll talk about the strategic overview committee, um, basically how we want to put that together. Kind of go from there. I want to put that together tonight, or, or start the process tonight. Yeah, I mean, I would guess when we talk about that group. I mean, when we look at a group and help decision making, I'm sure it's very similar. You're looking for a cross section, a lot of different perspectives, and people that have kids in school, people that no longer have kids in school, ag business owners, homeowners. I mean, I'm sure it's the same type of same type of group. And I, I guess I would say I think that group probably is a good group with some kind of facility work and facilities facility study and 